I really liked him and felt really good about where things were going and our conversations and time spent together. She was a girl that thought she was going to meet a nice guy, and the nice guy turned out to be Scott Peterson, who was a married man with a missing wife, who, you know, took it to a whole nother level in terms of deceit. At the end of our last episode, Scott Peterson's lies caused his half-sister, Ann Bird, to kick him out of her house. Though she made it seem like sending him 12 hours away from Berkeley was a favor to Scott, rather than a way to put some distance between him and her family. Ann's husband, Tim, was leery of her little brother from the moment he moved in, noticing he seemed light as a feather in the aftermath of his wife Lacey's disappearance nearly a month before. Tim wasn't pleased to have Scott move in, but after things began to crumble for his brother-in-law, Tim relented out of compassion for his wife, and soon, Scott Peterson was living in his loft. Scott had grown used to the mobs of press and constant surveillance by police while he carried on living in the home he once shared with Lacey and Modesto. He stood his ground even as he began to receive threats from the public. But after his house was burglarized by a freaky neighbor, Scott scrambled out to the coast to stay with Ann and Tim Bird on the 20th of January. Just four days later, after hearing Scott's mistress, Amber Fry, speak to the media, Tim made it clear to his wife that he no longer wanted her brother in their house or near their two small boys. Ann continued to defend Scott as four more tense days passed with Tim. But when she saw his interview with Diane Sawyer on the 28th, Anne ran out of excuses. She was still nowhere near ready to assume he was guilty as Tim had long before, but she knew parts of that interview were blatant lies, and for the first time, she considered her husband might be right about keeping Scott at arm's length. Anne's solution was to send him 12 hours south to her parents' cabin in Lake Arrowhead, though he still frequented her place in Berkeley often, much to Tim's dismay. The cabin at Lake Arrowhead was set back on a gorgeous piece of property just far enough east of Los Angeles to be picturesque and secluded. In fact, the biggest selling point Anne used to convince Scott to stay there was the isolated location, knowing he'd appreciate some cover from the prying eyes of the media, not to mention the police. Anne's goal was simply to put some space between Scott and Tim and their boys. Even though she tried to present the move in a different light, Anne knew that Scott knew that she wanted him out of her house. Her hands shook with nerves as she gave him the keys to the cabin, and she could see the hurt on his face as he asked her, Why? You don't want me here anymore? Anne was in a tough spot with Scott, and although his public image was deteriorating rapidly, she knew he wasn't capable of hurting Lacey, and her first instinct was to protect and support her brother. But, as Tim kept reminding her, she didn't really know Scott, only meeting him five years before, along with the rest of the Petersons. Even though Anne was shocked by the behavior she'd witnessed from Scott while he stayed in their loft, it was seeing him lie so casually about Lacey's investigation that shook her confidence in Scott for the first time. While her trust in him wouldn't crumble immediately, it wasn't long before Anne had some dark questions about her new little brother. Amber Fry came forward. I'm glad she did. You are? Definitely. Why? It's the appropriate thing to do. And it really shows what a person of character she is. Um, and it allows us to um, get back looking for Lacey. Did you tell her that you were not married? I did. I did. Um, and then when uh, Lacey disappeared, um, I called her and admittedly it wasn't immediately. It was a couple days after Lacey's disappearance. I telephoned her and told her the truth. The and truth? That I was married, that Lacey had disappeared. She didn't know about it at that point. And then she contacted the police. You know but Scott Fry says man. she first found out about Lacey from the news, not from Scott. Were you in love with her? 
Was this the first time? Are there others out there? No. There's no one else who can come forward? No. I owe a tremendous uh, apology to, to everyone. Had you told anyone? Did you tell police? I told the police immediately. When? That was uh, the first night we were together. The, the police, I spent um, with the police. You told them from, about her? Yeah, from December 24th on. During the interview with Diane Sawyer in late January, Scott claimed to have told police about his affair with Amber Fry on Christmas Eve, hours after his wife vanished, which was an easily provable lie. But Scott also claimed he told Lacey about his affair as well, two weeks before she disappeared. Both of his claims were explosive, and the shockwave provoked a strong reaction not only from his sister Ann Bird, but from Amber Fry, and of course from Lacey's mother Sharon Rocha as well. Although, as we'll see, the three women would have drastically different responses. Scott tried to clean up after his blatant lie on national television, and he had his explanation ready. But the calls he made to try to clarify his thinking weren't placed to Anne, Amber, Sharon, or anyone else close to Lacey, who'd been shocked, angered, and hurt by his claims. Instead, Scott called the producers at Good Morning America and the detectives working the case to explain that he'd mistakenly given the wrong information during the interview. Had you told anyone? Did you tell police? I told the police immediately. When? That was uh, the first night we were together. The, the police I spent um, with the police. You told them from, about her? Yeah, from December 24th on. That wasn't true, and Scott Peterson called us after the interview to set the record straight. He said he never told the police about his affair with Amber Fry, but claims he did tell his wife. Yeah. Did your wife find out about it? I told my wife. When? In um, early December. All three women watched the lie leave his lips at the same moment, but from different cities and from far different perspectives. Sister, lover, and mother to his missing wife. As we draw closer to the end of the investigation, we'll see how the instincts of each woman played out when police dug their heels in, depending upon their role in his life. His older sister, Ann Bird, kept Scott at a safe distance for a while after hearing his lies but quickly resumed their relationship, spending far more time with him than she ever had before Lacey vanished, and continuing to support him well after his arrest for her murder. Scott still hoped to maintain a relationship with Amber Fry, not knowing she'd been working with police for weeks, recording their calls and feeding him questions from detectives. And it's unclear whether Scott knew Amber found another man's shoulder to cry on as they continued communicating through the beginning of April. Of course, there was no confusion for Amber Fry as to when and how police learned she was dating Scott Peterson because she'd called them herself. And while she was frustrated to hear him lie about it, Amber was even more upset with some of the other things that Scott had to say during that interview. His comments about Lacey and Connor on Good Morning America had a more extreme impact on Lacey's mother, Sharon, causing her to consider killing Scott herself. Since becoming certain of his guilt, Sharon resisted her impulse to seek justice through vengeance, entertaining thoughts of harming him, torturing him for information, even killing him, but never taking them seriously, knowing she could never follow through with such horrendous things. Until watching Scott tell the world he had confessed his affair to Lacey and that she'd quietly made a peace with it just two weeks before she went missing, causing something to shift in Sharon, and the alteration terrified her. That barrier of conscience and consequence that had been keeping her violent thoughts at bay temporarily shattered, and for the first time since her daughter was taken from her, Sharon felt herself truly capable of murder. If not for Ron stepping in, she may have acted on her instinct to kill Scott, and it scared her to know that if he'd been near when that horrible moment struck, she would have done something monstrous herself. While Scott's sister Anne's reaction to his disastrous interview was to keep him at arm's length and consider her doubts, Sharon Rocha needed no more convincing he'd killed Lacey. She was furious about his lies before even watching the remainder of his exchange with Diane Sawyer. Ron got a call from Scott at 6.55 that morning, about an hour before the show aired. Apparently, he wanted to prepare them for what they were about to hear mainly that he'd told Lacey about Amber Fry in early December, 
But Sharon vividly recalled being at Scott and Lacey's house with Ron for dinner in mid-December, and there hadn't been a hint of anything amiss between them the entire evening. Even when Scott was late coming home from his business trip, which Sharon would later learn was actually an overnight visit with Amber, there was no suspicion, anger, or sadness from Lacey, and no tension between them. Sharon didn't believe for a minute that Lacey ever knew Scott was cheating. She may not have wanted to announce her husband was fooling around, but her mother was certain someone would have noticed something was off, even if she'd kept it to herself. Though Lacey's beaming smile never faltered, and she never confided in anyone. There's no way Lacey knew, Sharon shouted at Ron, absolutely livid as he hung up the phone with Scott, knowing immediately that he had to be lying. Did your wife find out about it? I told my wife. When? In um, early December. Did it cause a rupture in the marriage? It was not um, a positive, obviously. It's a, you know, inappropriate. Um, but it was not something that we weren't um, dealing with. A lot of arguing? No, no. No, um, I, I, you know, I can't say that that even, you know, she was okay with the idea. But uh, it wasn't anything that would break us apart. There wasn't a lot of anger? No. no. Do you really expect people to believe that an eight-and-a-half-month pregnant woman learns her husband has had an affair and is saintly and casual about it, accommodating, makes a peace with it? Well, I, yeah, I, you don't know. No one knows our relationship but us. Um, and that's at peace with it, not happy about it. Why did you tell her? It was the right thing. Because again, you know that people sitting at home have imagined that either you were in love with someone else, Mm -hmm. therefore you decided to get rid of this entanglement, namely your wife and your child, or there was just an angry confrontation. Neither of those was the case. It's... It's that simple. He insisted all was well between him and Lacey. As she watched him try to awkwardly explain himself when the interview aired shortly after, it was clear she wasn't the only one who found his claims to be hard to swallow. Sharon almost cheered aloud when Diane Sawyer said as much, asking Scott if he expected the world to believe his pregnant wife would make peace with his adultery. Sharon hadn't seen tears on Scott's cheeks once since Lacey had been gone, not until she watched him on national television. For her, the display was sickeningly insincere. She lost her temper when Scott grinned at the mention of murder, saying he didn't want to think of Lacey as dead, but that those thoughts still crept in. Sharon snapped and screamed at him through the screen, Tell us what you did to Lacey. Tell us where she is. That interview only added to the slew of other things that led Lacey's mother to be certain Scott was guilty, not the least of which were the long-term plans he made with Amber Fry. Scott presented himself to Amber as a wifeless, dogless bachelor who fervently didn't want children, mentioning his desire to have a vasectomy on multiple occasions during the short time they dated. Sharon also knew that he assured Amber that even though he didn't want his own children, he was thrilled at the prospect of being a father to her young daughter, Ayana, and raising her as his own. Hearing those things must have cut Sharon deeper than any fling or one-night stand ever could have, leaving no doubt why she was overwhelmed after speaking with Amber Fry in late January. The two women met again in mid-February, and their second meeting was even more tense. By the end of it, Sharon was irritated enough to show Amber to the door herself. The tension with Sharon Rocha came at the end of a rough week for Amber Fry, 
She remained in contact with Scott through early February as her birthday approached and Lacey's family agonized over baby Connor's due date, which both happened to fall on the 10th. Scott's focus seemed to be drawn more to Amber than to Lacey and Connor that week. He'd written a lovely note to go along with a selection of thoughtful and symbolic gifts he picked out for Amber, and he came up with a clever way to get them to her after his attempts to see her in person failed. Scott called Amber twice before 9 a.m. on the morning of Connor's due date, once to wish her a happy birthday, and again to tell her her gift was hidden somewhere outside of Valley Children's Hospital, an odd location to send Amber to on the day his missing baby boy was due. Scott gave her clues over the phone to find his hiding spot, conjuring thoughts of a twisted treasure hunt, telling Amber to search for a particular street lamp next to a lavender bush somewhere on the hospital grounds. She found the street lamp and the lavender bush, pulling out a paper Trader Joe's bag that had been tucked deep inside its branches. The bag contained three separate gifts, along with a handwritten note, and each item seemed to hold some special meaning. The first gift Scott left for Amber was a Nora Jones CD. It was her 2002 Come Away With Me album that featured a few interesting song titles, including I've Got to See You Again, Cold Cold Heart, Turn Me On, and of course, the title track, Come Away With Me. Although she later asked him about the album, Amber never learned, or at least she never shared, what significance it held for Scott. The next item she found in the bag was a bit more expensive, a beautiful amber pendant on a silver chain. It was displayed in a decorative silver box with a sun and moon on the lid. The third and final gift was a package of butterfly wildflower seeds meant to attract the creatures when in bloom. This was Scott's way of giving Amber the butterflies he'd promised to take her to see weeks earlier, before he admitted to having a missing pregnant wife, but after Amber had known about Lacey for days. She remembered that call well. He assured her they'd be together for her birthday, and he said he wanted to take her to the largest butterfly kaleidoscope in California with him. This just days after police told Amber he'd likely killed his wife and baby. Amber began to cry as she reached for the note in the bottom of the Trader Joe's bag, and her tears streamed as she read it. These seeds as your life are soon to bloom. Bliss, joy, and beauty will spring forth as warmth touches each one. Your soil is not a stony place. You have tilled good ground. You deserve wondrous ecstasy in all aspects of your life. All these things will be yours soon. Scott. Amber sat in her car with the note in her hand and his gifts on her lap and sobbed. She felt sorry for Scott, knowing how defeated he sounded during their recent conversations. She cried for herself, feeling much the same way. Later, she celebrated her birthday surrounded by friends and cut loose at her party that night, but she hadn't forgotten It should have been Connor's birthday as well. She switched on the television and cried again as she watched mourners sing I'm With You by Avril Lavigne during another vigil for Lacey and Modesto, this one held to commemorate her due date. As Amber wiped her tears and climbed into bed with Ayana after a bizarre birthday, the Modesto PD sent their case file against Scott to the Stanislaus County DA's office. Amber's life during this time was dramatic, chaotic, and painful. We know her relationship with her sister Ava was already on the rocks and that there'd been some tension with her father as well, but she'd also lost her best friend, Sean Sibley, during this time. Sean had been Amber's close friend for several years up until shortly after she introduced her to Scott Peterson. And while many might assume that introduction played a role in their falling out, as we'll see, it was more of a family affair. Sean Sibley not only skipped Amber's birthday party, but removed her from her wedding guest list, leaving Amber to learn from several mutual friends who did attend her party that they'd received invitations to Sean's wedding weeks before. Plainly, the drama between them was serious, and much of it stemmed from an incident that took place the month prior, but this time Scott wasn't at the center of it. Which brings us to Uncle Doug. Uncle Doug is Doug Sibley, aka Paul Benson in Amber's book and Sean Sibley's uncle in real life. You'll recall from previous episodes that Doug Sibley is rather protective of Amber, 
He's the same man who scolded Scott for breaking his promise to call her on Christmas Day. Fast forward to the middle of January. Amber is staying with Doug Sibley and his unnamed spouse, who Amber calls Lauren in her book. Amber described the Sibleys as being like part of her family. She felt safe in their house and didn't want to be alone in hers, having just met with a DOJ profiler about Scott. She and Ayanna had already been at the Sibleys for several days on the 12th of January, when Amber heard something outside in the darkness, just before daybreak. A moment later, Doug Sibley walked into Amber's room, looked at her intently, and said, I want to know how you feel about me, Amber. The noise she had just heard was his wife's car door as she left, but when Amber asked if she was going to work at that hour, things quickly got uncomfortable with Uncle Doug. You turned into this beautiful young mother, so full of love, he said. It was immediately apparent to Amber that Doug's feelings for her went far deeper than she ever realized and that he'd just revealed them to Lauren, causing her to storm out of the house and leave. Amber knew in that moment she'd have to cut ties with the Sibleys. She'd known them for ten years and spent all the major holidays there, not to mention being Sean's best friend. Amber gathered her things, picked up Ayanna, and left. Though she and Sean talked about the incident immediately after, their relationship never recovered. However, Uncle Doug and Lauren seemed to recuperate nicely. Amber saw the couple on Valentine's Day, holding hands as they entered a local restaurant. But by Valentine's on the 14th, the drama with the Sibleys must have seemed a small issue, compared to the ongoing media catastrophe that began for Amber the week before. On January 9th, roughly 24 hours before she opened her birthday gifts from Scott, Amber's topless photos were printed in the National Enquirer, eventually making their way into the mainstream media leaving her mortified and furious. Feeling judged by the media and frustrated at being portrayed as less than a decent person, Amber was particularly irritated with the negative press after all she'd done to help the police, most recently racking up a massive cell phone bill recording her conversations with Scott. The Modesto Police Department promised to pay her bill but had yet to follow through and the phone was turned off. Amber continued to record, using landlines at home and work and borrowing cell phones from friends. By mid-February, Modesto police still hadn't reconnected her line, even though the wiretap for Scott's phones expired on the 4th, nearly two full weeks before, leaving Amber's tapes as one of the few sources of audio surveillance detectives had left. She vented to Scott as the embarrassing pictures started showing up on the primetime news, but also mentioned that her cell phone had been disconnected, leaving out the part about the police department's promise to pay the bill, of course. Ironically, Scott immediately offered to take care of the debt for her, having no idea that using his credit card to turn Amber's phone back on would only make it easier for police to collect evidence against him. Even though Scott offered several times, Amber didn't accept his money, telling Scott thanks but no thanks. It wasn't the first time she'd turned down a large financial gift from him either. He wanted to pay to send her on a relaxing getaway just a few weeks before. But as Scott offered to pay Amber's bills, send her on trips, and prioritize buying birthday gifts for both her and her daughter, some might wonder where the money was coming from, even if it was going on his credit card. Scott was accustomed to making over $100,000 a year selling fertilizer with Trade Corp, and that was before adding Lacey's salary as a substitute teacher. But his finances got rocky not long after Lacey vanished. He downgraded from the warehouse to a small storage locker to try to save money on the lease. He also asked his father Lee for $5,000 and tried to get the mortgage payment to come out of Lacey's search fund in early January. As of mid-February, Scott still had his job, but that would change sometime between late March and early April when Trade Corp let him go. As for Amber's response to the leaked photos, she went on the hunt for a good attorney, having no intention of letting the issue go without a fight. She eventually met with infamous civil rights attorney Gloria Allred. Allred spent decades advocating for the rights of unpopular victims, particularly women. She describes herself as a fearless feminist, activist, and advocate. The two women hit it off immediately, and Allred represented Amber through the entirety of Scott's trial. But it's not clear if her new high-powered attorney was ever able to get Amber's topless photos out of the tabloids. 
Amber was involved in a $6 million lawsuit over the pictures in October of 2004 against a man named David Hans Schmidt. Schmidt, a.k.a. the Sultan of Sleaze, was named in the suit for posting the pictures on a pay-per-use website without Amber's permission. While we don't know if All Red represented her in this lawsuit or how it panned out, we do know things didn't go well for the Sultan of Sleaze after Amber sued him. He eventually pled guilty to attempting to extort $1.3 million from Tom Cruise a few years later and hung himself in Arizona not long after. Scott tried to console Amber about the pictures, who was understandably upset after a Fox News program displayed them nonstop through an entire segment. The program was hosted by a woman named Rita Cosby, and Scott let Amber know he'd called Rita directly to let her know she was pathetic, disgusting, and low-class for airing those photos. Amber seemed to genuinely appreciate his twisted chivalry. Their conversations had softened a great deal since the month before, though they were also shorter and less frequent and become eerily casual on both ends. With the exception of Scott's call to Amber on the 7th of February, she answered the phone just before 11 p.m., and he was distraught. Soon after, he was in tears and begging to see her, and he wanted to come to her house. I can't have you coming to my house, Scott, she said, quickly shooting him down, reminding him that they'd be spotted by the press. But then he suggested she make the five-hour drive south to him at the secluded cabin on Lake Arrowhead, a property generously opened to him by Ann Bird's parents, Tom and Jerry Grady who had no idea he would invite Amber there. Of course, Amber turned down the invitation to the Grady's cabin, telling Scott there were media people everywhere, following them both, and that it could be destructive for her to meet with him. Amber told Scott she didn't want her family, particularly her father, to catch wind she was still connected with him. Ron Fry was very upset by the notion the two were still an item, and he'd been known to speak out in the press to straighten the record after hearing reports that his daughter was still involved with Scott Peterson. Amber's dad wasn't the only man in her life who didn't appreciate her continued link to Scott. It was early January when she made the call to Dave Markovich for a shoulder to cry on, which led to a romantic relationship very soon after. Dave was an old friend and an old boss though it's not clear if they'd been physically involved while they worked together months previously. Amber completed her internship for massage therapy out of Dave's chiropractic office, and she worked there until moving to American Body Works, just days before meeting Scott. And so, behind the scenes of the calls and emails between Scott and Amber between mid-January and early April was Dave Markovich, trying to be Amber's new boyfriend. This must have complicated her life even further as she continued calling Scott and making her tapes for police. But during the 11 calls they exchanged through the month of February, neither of them mentioned Lacey even once. At one point in her book, Amber described how difficult it was to carry on being deceptive with Scott, saying she would have to prepare herself for their calls like an athlete would psych themselves up for a big game. She explained that keeping up with his lies while carrying on with her role as an informant was especially taxing for her because she's such an honest person. Amber wrote about her response to Scott's interview with Diane Sawyer in her book as well, apparently still upset by the time it went to print in early 2005. In the following excerpt from her book, Witness for the Prosecution of Scott Peterson, Amber described in her own words how she felt about that interview. Amber wrote, quote, on January 28th, Diane Sawyer aired an interview with Scott Peterson on Good Morning America. Scott told Sawyer that he and Lacey had a glorious marriage. She was amazing, it is amazing, he said, correcting himself. When she asked him about his unborn child, noting that he hadn't mentioned him, Scott appeared to be struggling with his emotions. He claimed that it was too hard for him to go into the baby's room that door's closed until there's someone to put in there, he said. His feelings for me were clearly not as intense as his feelings for his unborn child. When Diane asked him point blank if he was in love with me, Scott didn't even have to think about it. No, he said. I'd have to say that I respect her, and as I imagine everyone does after seeing her come out and do that press conference, what an amazing character she has. End quote, and the end of Amber's excerpt. 
Her book went on to describe hearing him lie to Diane about the investigation as well, but when she recorded her discussion with Scott that evening, the first thing Amber asked him about was denying that he loved her, and she described hearing that denial as a slap in the face. Scott never told Amber he loved her. Amber met Scott nine weeks before that interview aired. They hadn't seen each other in person for the past six of those. As he became a central focus of the investigation to find his missing pregnant wife, and she began to secretly record their conversations for police. The two of them had been on three dates total, four if you include December 9th, when he dropped in just after buying his boat to confess that he was married, but that his wife was dead. Amber later wrote that she realized it didn't really hurt her to hear him say he didn't love her and that nothing Scott Peterson could ever do would ever truly touch her in any fundamental way. Clearly, Amber already had a lot to deal with when her topless photos ran in the National Enquirer on February 9th. The pictures quickly bled out elsewhere, adding another thick layer of stress and more problems Amber certainly didn't need. It wasn't a pleasant birthday surprise. She was angry with the media now that they'd turned on her, and it wasn't long before Fox News reported the pictures were part of an entire calendar shoot, which was a complete fabrication. At that point, Amber considered speaking out to tell her side of the story, but she said she wanted to consult Lacey's family before talking to the media. However, Sharon Rocha says otherwise, claiming she's the one who reached out to Amber after hearing through the grapevine about her plans to begin taking interviews. Sharon requested a visit from Amber in mid-February, after Connie Chung wrote her a handwritten letter and was slated to be Amber's first stop along the media circuit. They sat down together again in Sharon's living room, but the first thing Amber mentioned was her disconnected phone, complaining to Sharon about going 2,000 minutes over last month's cell plan, mainly due to her calls with Scott. In 2003, most cell phone companies charged per minute for overage and Amber was frustrated at the Modesto Police Department's failure to pay the $800 bill after being under the impression they would cover it. Eventually, Sharon offered to make some calls herself to try and get her phone turned back on, at which point the discussion turned to Amber's press engagements. Sharon let Amber know she and the rest of Lacey's family would appreciate her silence. They worried she could jeopardize the investigation and maybe even Scott's future prosecution, if she let the wrong information out to the public. Amber was a key witness to Scott's motive, and in that moment, Lacey's family didn't want anything to get in the way of their quest for justice, not knowing if they would ever get a day in court for Lacey and Connor. Amber made it clear she was interested in exploring the opportunities being presented by the media. But Sharon clarified that what Amber was seeing as an opportunity had been an unimaginable tragedy for her and her family. She also explained that Amber could get three or four times more money for the same interview if she just stayed silent a little while longer. The networks would up their offers as they grew more desperate for her story, and Amber could increase her opportunities substantially if she just waited them out. Sharon was relieved and grateful when she agreed to hold off on speaking to the press but had another question while she had Amber there. She suddenly asked if Scott ever had a picture of her. Yes, Amber said. She'd given him a card with a photo of both her and her daughter inside. Would Lacey have known Scott was cheating if she'd found that card? Would it have been obvious? Sharon asked. Yes, Amber told her. Yes, it would have been obvious if she had found it. But Lacey never found that card, she said. Sharon was immediately offended by her tone and asked how she could have possibly known that. How could she be so sure her daughter had never seen that picture? Amber said she was certain Lacey would never found it because Scott told her so. Sharon was baffled and speechless, silently wondering how she could ever believe a word Scott said to her. Sharon ended their visit and showed Amber to the door. The two women parted decently that day, but Amber wasn't the only one left struggling after the previous week's events. For Sharon, they were easily some of her darkest days thus far, as Lacey's due date came and went with no updates, and her communications with Scott deteriorated significantly. Sharon had been asking his permission to pick up some of Lacey's things from the house for weeks with no results. She also begged, screamed, and reasoned with Scott for answers about Lacey, 
before he eventually stopped returning her calls. She called him on the 8th of February, begging for him to help them bring Lacey home. She and 500 volunteers came up empty-handed after searching a wilderness area off of I-5 for Lacey's body, drawn there because it was on his route to Berkeley Marina. Sharon was depressed, exhausted, and desperate when she pleaded for him to just tell them where she was. You loved her once, she said. Please don't leave her out there all alone. She even suggested he call in an anonymous tip leaving Lacey's location, then leave the country to save himself. When they spoke again later that day, things got far more heated as Sharon called him out for not even being near Modesto, let alone looking for Lacey, and then for not having a drop of emotion since she disappeared, and the conversation went downhill from there. Sharon told Scott that Lacey was part of her, that she needed to have her home as she would need a piece of herself and that she couldn't function without her. When Scott responded by saying Lacey was his joy and happiness, she shouted at him, Then why did you kill her? Scott told her not to buy into the crap from the media, but Sharon had no use for that. She didn't need the media to confirm behavior she saw from him with her own eyes. She made one final plea asking if Scott would want his mother to go through the torment of losing him and having his body thrown away somewhere and lost forever. Scott didn't answer and changed the subject back to insisting that they would find Lacey, but Sharon cut him off to remind him that he would be the one to burn in hell for what he had done and that he had one small chance at redemption if he could assemble enough compassion to help them bring Lacey home. She told Scott to call her if he ever got a heart, soul, or conscience, but until then not to bother her family, because they all knew he killed Lacey. Sharon burst into tears of frustration after hanging up with Scott on the 8th, and she absolutely dreaded going through Connor's due date with no new information and not a hint of remorse from Scott. In fact, Scott told her plainly that he wasn't remorseful because he had done nothing wrong. The next day, Sharon accepted an invitation to get away to the mountains with friends. She decided to make a batch of cookies to share with the group, but that was easier said than done. She hadn't worked in the kitchen since Lacey went missing, and the tears streamed down her face through every step of the recipe. As Connor's due date approached, and Scott worked to get quiet time with Amber at the cabin in Lake Arrowhead, Sharon retreated to a secluded cabin as well. Patty Amherst and a few other close friends took her away to a small hamlet in the mountains called Strawberry, hoping to quiet her mind. Sharon took in the brisk, refreshing air of the Sierra Nevada mountains as she sat on the deck with friends, looking out at a sea of magnificent pine trees. They nibbled on Sharon's batch of oatmeal chocolate chip cookies, chatting as they gazed at the stars on the evening of the night, deliberately avoiding the subject of Lacey and Connor. They talked about anything and everything else, although it did little good. Sharon awoke to such a heavy sense of emptiness and loss on the 10th, she couldn't take a breath without thinking of them. The memory of that hurt is still so painful for Sharon, she wished she could erase the day from her life. As she focused on her daughter and her grandson, grieving over where they could possibly be, her mind played tricks and her mood flipped to a sudden surge of optimism. Envisioning Lacey making her way to a hospital or clinic somewhere to deliver baby Connor. Encouraged someone could spot her out somewhere now that Connor was due. The small sprig of hope caused her to rush home, just in case someone somewhere did see something. But the days crept by with no news. There was a brief mention of a possible sighting in Washington State, but it turned out to be nothing. Again. A week later, Sharon watched on the news as police served their second search warrant on the house and seized Scott's new truck. The cameras caught him scowling on the driveway as an officer drove it away. Although police returned the truck a few hours later, it was far from a sign that they were easing up on Scott. Lead Detective Craig Grogan's request for the second search warrant outlined a soft kill, either by smothering or strangulation. And with no defensive wounds on Scott, he suspected Lacey had been incapacitated with poison or drugs before she was attacked. Grogan believed Lacey was killed in the bedroom, wrapped in a tarp, and dragged out the living room door on the north side of the house, leaving the rug scrunched up at the threshold. 
and he noted that Scott let McKenzie out of the gate with his leash on after loading Lacey into his truck. Grogan laid out Scott's motive in the request as well, pointing to a failed business coupled with the financial pressures of a wife with expensive taste and a child on the way. It was well known that Lacey wanted to upgrade her car, and Grogan told the judge that Scott had no desire to have a child, but wished to continue his ongoing affair with Amber Fry. It wasn't long before the judge signed off on the warrant. Grogan identified 24 items he wanted to collect from the house on the 18th, several of which correlated with his theory about Lacey's homicide, including syringes, poisonous liquids, and injectable chemicals that could cause death. He also wanted some of Mackenzie's hair to compare with dog hair found on a blue tarp recovered by divers at the bay. Police removed 90 articles out of the house during the search, including a brown paper bag containing a set of men's blue cotton pajamas and a few thousand dollars in cash, but no syringes or poisons. It must have been a big travel day for Scott. He was at Anne's place in Berkeley at some point that day and told her he had just come from Lake Arrowhead to return a shovel. She thought that was odd, wondering what use he had for a shovel, and she asked him about it. But he blew her off and started sorting through his mail. Apparently, he'd recently been to his post office box in Modesto as well. As she watched him sort through the peculiar things from his mailbox, she quickly forgot about the shovel. The first thing that stuck out to Anne was a picture of a praying mantis. It'd been cut out of a magazine and glued to a piece of cardstock but there was nothing written on it, no text and no message, just the picture. Scott picked it up and said, What an idiot. Everyone knows mantises eat their lovers, but this moron got it backwards. It's the girl that eats the guy. Someone else sent him a cartoon-like drawing of Lacey crying. In the background, the artist drew Scott and Amber in a truck with a talk bubble over his head saying, Come on, baby as he and Amber left Lacey behind. Scott flipped through the rest of it, almost amused, saying, the hate mail just keeps on coming, as he opened another envelope. This one contained an actual written note, and from the clean, soft, cursive hand it was written in, Anne suspected it had been penned by a woman, but the message was clearly a threat. We know what you did. You will never be safe. One of us will always be following you. Turn around. We will be there. Scott's mail was getting creepier by the minute, and Anne suggested he turn that last piece over to police. But Scott simply said, why bother? It's from the Roaches, as if there were no question in his mind. That's ridiculous, Anne said. How can you say that? But Scott had another card in his hand now, as he asked her, is it Ryan's birthday or something? holding up a small, simple card with a cake and three candles printed on the front. Who would send something like that? Anne asked, suddenly very creeped out. There was no return address. It was her oldest son Ryan's third birthday that day, but none of the people who knew that would send him a card with no return address, and certainly not to Scott's post office box in another city. The sender wrote, Happy Birthday, Ryan, on the inside but left it unsigned. Anne thought this was a message for her, letting her know that others knew Scott was staying at their house. And even though he did use the cabin Anne tried to scoot him off to, he was still at the bird's house so frequently, Tim got frustrated again, wondering what the point was in asking him to leave in the first place. Anne was unsettled by the birthday card, so much so she was paranoid and jumpy after seeing it. But not wanting to deal with Tim's reaction, she never shared it with him. She likely didn't want to deal with Tim, as Anne already had a lot on her plate already. Was Scott regularly popping in unannounced or last minute, seeming to leave her with a troubling story on each visit, and near constant calls now from their mother, Jackie? Anne felt Jackie's desperation grow as Scott's friends dropped like flies throughout February and March and Jackie was furious when he'd been asked to step away from his sales position at Trade Corp, essentially leaving him unemployed. Scott may have used some of his newly acquired free time to go golfing at the Del Rio Country Club, and he invited his realtor, Brian Argan, to join him for a round at the club several times, 
but Brian turned him down. In the middle of March, Argan told Detective Brocchini he wasn't comfortable around Scott anymore. When Scott asked Brian to put in a good word for him with the media, Brian refused that request as well, not willing to defend Scott after seeing him dance around the subject of Lacey's disappearance. But Brian wasn't the only member of the Del Rio Country Club who didn't appreciate having to share the facilities with Scott Peterson. A number of other members approached the board, demanding action be taken, and soon afterward they made the decision to buy back Scott's membership. His half-sister Anne was part of a rapidly shrinking group of people who wanted anything to do with Scott, let alone believed in his innocence and Anne speculated Jackie began calling more and more often, trying to ensure she stayed on Scott's side. Jackie carried on with her degradation of the media, the police, and the investigation, and she repeated what Anne called Jackie's mantra, Scott is not evil. Scott is not evil. She would be sure to tell Anne this on every call. But gradually, Jackie started to remind Anne not to discuss anything with the police. She began repeating this so often Anne got frustrated and told her birth mother that it was ridiculous. She told Jackie she planned to tell police as much as she could about anything she could if it would help them find Lacey. Wasn't that the point, Anne asked her, to be as honest and helpful as possible? Anne knew Jackie wasn't pleased to hear that from her, and she felt bad because she also knew Jackie believed from day one her son had been framed. As a mother herself, Anne thought of her boys and tried to understand. Maybe claiming he was set up by police and others was the only avenue Jackie could take that didn't lead her to Scott. As his mother, Jackie defended and protected him fiercely, and she knew that soon those same detectives who had done her boy so wrong in Modesto would be coming to Anne with more questions about Scott. Lead Detective Grogan did call soon after but Jackie needn't worry much about what Anne told him. In fact, what she said that day made Scott sound so good, his defense ended up using part of her statement during the trial. Anne told Grogan how much she liked Jackie and the rest of the Petersons, and that she was particularly fond of Scott and Lacey. She described him as a nice guy and a good person, telling Grogan there was just no way Scott did this horrible thing to his wife. Then Grogan asked what she knew about Amber Fry and inquired if Scott mentioned any other women he may have had relationships with. That's when Anne told Grogan about Scott's girl from San Luis Obispo, which may have been Janet Isle, who they already had a statement from. Scott never gave Anne the name of the girl so she couldn't share it, but Anne also kept Scott's story about taking turns with women on an airplane to herself because she wasn't sure if it was true. She didn't tell Grogan Scott wanted to change his name to Cal either, or that he now claimed that's what he and Lacey were going to name Connor. Cal, short for California. At the time, Scott was looking for a room to rent and having no success using his real name, it seemed nobody wanted to bunk with Scott Peterson, he called himself Cal during his search. Much to Tim's aggravation, Cal left the bird's home phone as the callback number, leaving he and Anne to field the responses from the ads. They'd been annoyed by the calls, but what stuck with Anne was the fact that Scott claimed he and Lacey were going to name Connor Cal. She'd never heard that name before, not from Lacey or Jackie or anyone. Not once. That wasn't the only detail Anne failed to share with detectives, though none of what she witnessed amounts to tangible evidence of anything either way. Some of the things she saw from Scott were definitely interesting. One day, shortly after Anne heard about Sharon Roach's vision of Lacey on her sofa, Scott stopped by the house. Still shaken up by Sharon's story, Anne mentioned it to him. He looked a little spacey for a second, and then he said, It's funny you should tell me that. I've had a couple of similar episodes. Anne was taken aback. Really? You saw Lacey? She asked. Yeah, he said. Oh my God, when? Anne asked. Scott told her he'd seen Lacey in the bathroom mirror just days before. Oh my God, what happened? Did she say anything? She asked. Just how I was doing and stuff, he said. That's all you can remember? She asked him. Scott simply replied yes and headed back up to the loft, 
but Anne recalled the rest of what Sharon said about her vision of Lacey, that hallucinations could be manifested by extreme grief, but that often the mind will conjure up visions and cases of extreme guilt as well. Not long after this, Scott dropped by for another last-minute visit with another ominous story for Anne. She was watching an episode of Murder, She Wrote when he called. He wasn't far from the house, and she told him to hurry because it was a good one. Anne made BLTs for the both of them, and they settled on the couch for the show, when Scott unexpectedly broke into a story. Anne says by the end of it, she was certain Lacey and Connor were never coming home. Scott began by telling Anne he'd been to the house featured in Murder, She Wrote. As Scott told Anne his story, she thought he was describing a visit to a house that looked like the one from the show, but he was actually telling her about the Blair House, which is the actual house used during filming. The Victorian home where the main character, Jessica Fletcher, who's played by Angela Lansbury, lived was nestled in a small, quaint, fictional town called Cabot Cove in the show. In real life, the house had been turned into a bed and breakfast in Mendocino, in a small cluster of similar themed historic buildings within the city called Mendocino Village, in an attempt to capture the feel of the fictional town of Cabot Cove from the infamous show. During Scott and Lacey's visit to the Blair House, they ventured out for a walk, soon finding themselves in an area of the village they'd never seen before. They strolled along a bit further, making their way into a small cemetery, but as they walked through it, they realized the rows of stones didn't end, but led into a much smaller and much older cluster of markers behind it. The area was badly overgrown, and he and Lacey had to step over a broken fence to get a good look at the headstones. From a distance, they looked so small, they both thought it might be a pet cemetery, until they moved closer. Anne held her breath as Scott continued his story in a flat, sedative voice, as if in a trance. He told Anne Lacey brushed the thick moss from the markers, finally able to make out the names and dates on the stones, realizing quickly that it wasn't a burial ground for pets at all, but for children. Dozens of them, all hidden beneath the weeds and shadows, forgotten to time. Lacey began to cry. She wanted to clean up the brush and plant flowers to make it beautiful for the children. She was very upset. When Scott said that last part, he was looking Anne in the eyes, near tears himself, and he said, it was just, you know, it was just really sad. The longer she thought on what he told her and the look in his eyes, the more she felt something was off about his tale. Anne wondered if Scott's story had been more of a message for her, a way for him to tell her the truth about Lacey and Connor without saying the words. Anne admitted her theory could have come purely from her imagination, but directly after saying that, she claimed that it was this story that convinced her that Lacey and Connor weren't coming back home. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed the episode and want to hear more stories like these, give it a like and subscribe to the channel before you go. Don't forget to leave your thoughts in the comments and check out our website and social media links down below. As always, until next time, stay safe, be kind, and memento mori.